Support comes from St. Louis Public Library Foundation, helping the library serve children and their families with programs and services needed to become lifelong readers. More information about the foundation is at slpl.org. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Chow. Fifty-three days before the November 5th election, there's going to be an all-ages party, complete with dancing, video and texting, spoken word and song in St. Louis. That event is called Dance the Vote, and this Saturday it returns to the Missouri History Museum to boost voter awareness and registration. Theater artist and activist Joan Lipkin is one of the co-founders of the Nonpartisan Initiative. She joins us now to share more about what's happening this weekend. Joan, welcome back to St. Louis on the Air. Oh my goodness, thanks so much for having us, Elaine. So we also have with us youth activist Precious Berry. This November 5th, Precious will cast a ballot in her first ever presidential election. Precious, welcome to you as well. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. So, Joan, let me start with you and Dance the Vote. Now, the first one took place in 2016. And since then, there have been a handful of Dance the Vote events. What is it, though, that makes this year's so critical and so necessary? Well, I think that we're at a crucial turning point for the country. I also think that uh, it's not just about the presidential. It's also about the down ballot, and it's about amendments. And even broader than that, it is about creating community cohesion and joy and a belief in the fact that your vote does matter. Mm-hmm. And the the turnout for the primary was quite dismal, wasn't it? Oh my goodness, it was just terrible. It was about 30% in the county and less than that in the city. And I think part of that is that people don't realize that voting in their local elections really affects their daily lives. Mm -hmm. There's just so much disinformation, misinformation out there, um, and that's why we try to combat that using the arts. Mm -hmm. Now, Precious, we noted in the intro that November's going to be the first time you're casting a vote in a presidential election. Yes. This is something that you're excited to do. Definitely. So as far as what Joan and I were just talking about, as Mm -hmm. far as low voter turnout, why is it that you are anticipating so much being able to vote on November 5th? Yeah, first, um, just even trying to cast my ballot in for the first black female president is big in itself. I didn't have the opportunity to first vote for the first black president. So actually having the opportunity to vote for the first black female president is super amazing in itself. Um, When we think about young people getting to the polls, I think about making sure that our voice is on the front line and that we are advocating and be a part of that decision-making process. That's how I got involved in politics, not necessarily having the opportunity opportunity to vote because of my age limit, but also making sure that I was volunteering at the polls, being an election judge, making sure that I was still finding my ways to make sure that my voice was being heard and also engaging in my community. Mm -hmm. Which means you're you're a veteran already. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait. You Mm -hmm. know, I was just telling Miss Joan earlier today um, how when I first stated when I'll have the opportunity to vote, I wanted to throw like a big voter registration party for me. <laughs> but this year, um, I voted in early April um, for the first time. And I didn't get the opportunity to do that because I was working the polls. So I was up at four in the morning, but um, it's still worth it within itself. Mm-hmm. Now, Joan, this week also happens to be, maybe not so happens to be, Disability Voting Rights Week. Yeah. More than 1.5 million voters in Missouri live with disabilities, and more than 38 million people with disabilities are eligible to vote in the United States. And yet barriers keep many of them from exercising their right to vote. What do disability rights advocates you're working with want people to better understand? Well, I, we want them to understand that 
disability is a part of life and that this could mean uh, impairment to hearing, vision, cognition, or mobility. Uh, but a lot of times these folks have a difficult time when they're trying to cast their vote. Uh, we need better access to in-person early voting, voting by mail, curbside, and ballot box drops that, that need to be adapted. We also need poll workers who are more experienced and educated about how to work with people. And there are actually a number of lawsuits that are going on right now because people with disabilities have faced particular challenges in Missouri and elsewhere to exercise this precious right. I do want to say that the issues for a lot of people with disabilities are different. Um, and, and there's also crossover with the general population. This could include affordable housing, independent living, Medicaid and health care, accessible transportation, inclusive education, community integration. So these are all things that are often on the plates of people with disabilities, as well as the wider concerns that most of the culture and population face. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important that we advocate for people with disabilities to be able to vote, and that is why this week is Disability Voting Rights Week. Mm -hmm. So the awareness part of it, yes, this is is what you're talking about. Yes, mm -hmm. and we make disability and inclusion part of absolutely everything that we always do in my theater company. But in this case, for example, so with Dance the Vote, uh, we are also going to have a community dance that um, will be accessible for everyone, whether they're seniors or folks with disabilities or young children. And that's in addition to our line dance. We're probably going to be doing the electric slide. And many different dance companies, Beyond Measure, Afro Kumba, Kumaya, um, uh, Resilience, Without Limits, St. Louis Rhythm Collaborative. We want to say that dance and this notion of art that's so inclusive is available and accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. Precious, are the issues that Joan is talking about, are they ones that people in your age group yeah. have a, a certain awareness already about yeah. that maybe is not recognized as awareness? Yeah. Um, you know, when I got involved um, in politics at the age of 15, I didn't see a lot of people in the room that looked like me, um, specifically young people. And I asked myself the question, what can I do at such an early age to make sure that my voice was being heard? Um, throughout this time, we may not see a lot of young people involved in politics in St. Louis. We're all scattered. So when we come together, we're more in solidarity. Mm -hmm. And having that conversation of, what can we do to make sure that we are advocating and being that catalyst for change? Um, I believe in the late, great Shirley Chisholm, her quote is, um, if America doesn't give you a seat at the table, we'll bring a folding chair. So with a lot of young people, we try to remind ourselves that we have to bring that folding chair to every room that we are stepping in to make sure that we are advocating. Even if we're under the age of 18, our voice still matters and it has merit, just as any other citizen who's eligible to vote. Mm -hmm. So actually having the opportunity for us to be able to vote in our first um, general election means a lot. Um, and it can be a shift in democracy, especially during the cruel time that we are in now mm -hmm. with making sure that youth voter turnout can actually change this election this year. And the issues that are going to be bringing yes. young people out and some of the lived experiences yes. that they've had themselves and what they have seen, mm -hmm. there is a intersectionality yes. right, with those who um, have there have barriers to access that are related not only to issues or identity traits yes. that have to do with race or socioeconomics. Mm -hmm. It is also about disability. But are other issues that are facing folks, mm -hmm. you know, who have felony convictions, you know, people who are living in poverty, you know, senior citizens, yeah. as you've mentioned, Joan. There are also people who don't drive, you know, people who work unique hours such that they're yeah. not able to to vote in the way that many people do. Are those issues also ones that young voters will be propelled by uh, mm -hmm. to go to to cast their ballots in November? Yeah. 
So um, when we think about the issues that um, young people may need or or experiencing um, in November, is making sure that they have access. A lot of young people may not even know the ways to go and vote. Um, there are so many resources out there that young people could go to, St. Louis County Elections or the city has one where you can actually go on their website and see what are the nearing polling places in St. Louis County or even St. Louis City, St. Charles County and other counties that are in cities that are out in St. Louis. But just making sure that young people are educated on what's going on. You can also see what the sample ballot is in the next month or so, if I'm correct. Um, just making sure that young people are aware of the issues that are going on. I mean, when I got involved in politics, as I stated again, I didn't know any issues that were on the ballot. I knew the issues that I was facing in my own community, but just making sure that we are educating our young folks to go into the right direction. And again, as I state, we need to make sure that we are doing our due diligence as citizens, as getting our young peoples to the polls, even if you're bringing your great-grandchildren, making sure that they have the opportunity to see what it's like to cast in your ballot it and also say is cast in your vote and your voice. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think that Dance the Vote is so important and imperative to society in St. Louis in itself to make sure that we are gathering friends and family for such an amazing event that is encouraging people to register to vote and also make sure that we are getting out to the polls mm -hmm. to have a hopeful election. So registering to vote is one of the goals of Dance the Vote. But it is not just for those who are unregistered. And this is an explicitly nonpartisan initiative, Joan. Why is that the case? It's nonpartisan because I don't think that we should be telling people what to do. We want them to do their research. And also because it, it protects the museum. You know, the museum can't be partisan. Mm -hmm. We can't be endorsing anybody. But more crucially, we can endorse the notion of voting, the history of voting, the joy of voting. Um, I do want to say that while we are sort of metaphorically uh, dancing our way to the polls for November 5th, um, people can vote in advance. Uh, and people can vote, they can register to vote, I should say, mm -hmm. online through many different mechanisms, including vote.org. However, they will need to have a government-issued photo ID. And that's challenging. So yeah. we have the Ashray Foundation joining us on Saturday who can help provide information about how people can get those photo IDs. I also want to say that if somebody is turning 18 before November 5th, they can vote, but they need to register by October 9th. So there's all this information, right, that we need to be able to share with people. I also want to say that, yes, this is, this is an intergenerational party. We have so much activity for children. Yeah. Children can decorate ballot boxes and future voting signs and do coloring and attend a trilingual storytelling session, etc. Because what we want to say is that we want to foster this idea that voting should be a family activity. And with the sort of closure of, uh, and, uh, of, of teaching civics and accurate information in many of our schools, we need as, as artists and as educators and as advocates to make sure that people understand that this is a sacred right. This is, as the late great John Lewis said, our best nonviolent tool of democracy is our right to vote. And so, but we don't have to be dire about it. I think even with the many, many challenges that we have, we are at a time when we need joy and positivity and community cohesion to bring people together. So whether people are registered to vote or not, we want them to come and dance with us in whatever capacity, or they can mm -hmm. just sit and watch and enjoy others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Precious, you talked about a great-grandmother or grandmother with a grandchild. Yes. Is there a memory that you have that is like that, um, that you hope to see this Saturday when Dance the Vote takes place? Yeah, um, I remember in 2016, uh, my mother actually took me to the polls with her. If it was um, 
Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Um, I remember going to the polls and she was like, okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk in here. We're going to sign in. And we remember just the whole process of her signing in. And she got her ballot. And we saw these little block offs where other people were voting. And we were like, wait, we're closed off so they can't see our vote? So my mom was telling us that we have to make sure that we have our own privacy to cast in our vote because this is our opportunity to make sure that we are being heard. So actually just being a part of that process for me was actually, as I look back, my first introductory into um, voting. And also I remember, I think it was like in 2009 or 8 when President Obama gave his inauguration and my grandmother was like, all of y'all are going to sit in here and we're going to watch this inauguration. <laughs> right. And we're like, why are you watching it? And my grandma was like, this is a history being made and we all need you. T-. Me and my brother was like, okay, we're going to sit in here and we watch the whole thing. And um, it was amazing. I think Maya Angelou, wasn't she a poet mm-hmm. um, during that time? And remember we was watching her... Um, giving her her speech, um, her poet, and was, like, very um, amazing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was so many opportunities that my family had, and even we had a big party when um, President Obama got elected into office, and I just remember the enjoyment in the room with my aunts and uncles and cousins and mom and everyone, mm-hmm. so well, grandma. Hope yeah. that, that is something that you will see just a, a slice of this Saturday. Yes. <laughs> Precious Berry is a native St. Louisan youth activist and WashU student who will be voting in her her first presidential election on November 5th, and Joan Lipkin is a theater artist and co-founder of the nonpartisan initiative Dance the Vote. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine. Dance Thank the Vote you. takes place this Saturday, September 14th, starting at 10 a.m. at the Missouri History Museum. Check out our website for more information. That's stlonair.show. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts.